This week, first up, we welcome Trevor Walsh, the global security strategi- strategist even at Chronicle, discussing how to get Google scaled threat detection with Chronicle Detect. In the enterprise security news, Radware announces expanded elastic scalability and resiliency for virtual DDoS protection. Newstar agrees to buy VeriSign's public DNS service, auto scaling network visibility in AWS Cloud. Palo Alto Networks introduces enterprise data loss prevention a new Casada API protects from botnet attacks and targeted fraud and so much more. In our final segment, we air two pre-recorded interviews with Jeff Capone from Secure Circle and Roy Cohen of Vicarious. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Data protection is a top priority with today's work from home workforce. However, current data loss prevention tools inadequately protect data in cloud or SaaS offerings from insider threats. Secure Circle automatically protects data as it leaves SaaS services such as GitHub, AWS, and Salesforce. The protection is transparent to users and works with any application to persistently protect data, even source code. Secure your data with Secure Circle Zero Trust Data Protection. Begin your 30-day free trial by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash secure circle. Can we continue to function without facts? Cyber criminals exploit the absence of facts, harming organizations through the easiest point of entry, email. No company should claim they can stop all phishing attacks. It's about having all the facts in seconds and reducing the time it takes to respond. It's minutes versus hours in the difference between a security incident and a breach. Great Horn, see through the dark. To learn more, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Great Horn. Today's networks are changing fast and employees, devices, and infrastructures are more distributed than ever. Gigamon Threat Insight is a cloud native, high velocity network detection and response solution that's purpose built to enable you to get in front of this transformation. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Gigamon. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly, episode 206 for November 11th, 2020. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Mr. Matt Alderman. Matt, welcome. Holy cow, it's Wednesday already. Whew. It is Wednesday, um, and I have another very special co-host with us today that I'm very excited to announce. Adrian Sanabria uh, is here with us on the show. And you may be wondering, what? wait, how, how is Adrian here? Adrian actually works for us uh, for the Cyber Risk Alliance and Security Weekly. And we're very excited to add him as a, an additional host on some of our shows, in addition to doing some fabulous work that you'll hear about more in the future. Adrian, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And um, yeah, looking forward to those uh, announcements, that, that secret work we're working on. The secret secret projects. In the meantime, we get to talk about enterprise security news and topics and all that kinds of fun stuff, which is uh, Adrian has a lot of fun talking about as well. So it's, uh, it's exciting. Absolutely. It's exciting. A uh, couple of quick announcements before we get into it t- today. Um, would you like to have all of your favorite Security Weekly content at your fingertips? Learn about upcoming webcasts and technical trainings, or just wish you could hang out with the Security Weekly cast and crew and community, as it were? Go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, where you can sign up for our mailing list, join our Discord server, and subscribe to all of the shows on the Security Weekly network. In our upcoming webcast and technical trainings, learn why you should stop trying to discover and classify data, how to thwart attackers using deception, and how to build risk-based vulnerability management programs. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. We've got a bunch coming up that represents at least three webcasts, maybe more, that we have coming up. So make sure you do that uh, and join. If you miss it, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Um, let's see. This segment is sponsored by Chronicle. To learn more about Chronicle, please visit securityweekly.com 
forward slash Chronicle. Here with us today from Google Cloud's Chronicle is Trevor Walsh. He is the global security strategist at Google Cloud's Chronicle team. Trevor's security passions include the SOC cloud gap, the efficacy of threat intelligence, hybrid cloud security automation, data visualization, and the blending of IT ops security at Petascale Analytics and threat detection. Wow, that was, that was a lot. Trevor, it's nice to have you on the show today. Thanks, Paul. It's an absolute pleasure and uh, really great to be here uh, at Security Weekly. Yes. Um, when, when we talk about the Chronicle solution, I, one of the things that jumps out at me uh, at first is uh, I put this in the category of log everything, collect everything, and then like worry about it later. And, and I think that's the, probably the first challenge that you know, I'd like to, to start with that I believe Chronicle addresses very well in that we should log everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like one of those things that's been really easier said than done for a lot of folks, right? I mean, I think that the idea of logging everything has existed for, oh my gosh, I mean, probably since like the, even before the ArcSight era, so you're going back 15 right. to 20 years ago. Um, building on that a little bit, I think the challenges that people end up having ends up being, I mean, there's scale challenges all over the place, right? So there's scale challenges with regards to ingest, there's scale challenges with regards to storage, there's even scale challenges with regards to network bandwidth. There's scale challenges with regards to the ability to normalize. But what ends up ultimately happening, and, and Paul, I think this is maybe where you're leading with it, what ends up happening is that people don't do this, or it's kind of they say, we've centralized everything except. Mm. And invariably, the, the except thing is the thing that matters. They say, we've got all the endpoint data. Well, except if you want the really contemporaneous detailed data, we store that kind of temporarily on each individual host where we've got all the cloud data except. Um, and I think that that's, that's been something that, that companies have added just a, a huge problem with. It's interesting, Trevor, you're, you're taking me back, right? 20 years ago, I remember sitting in SANS classes and having the instructors explain, you know, you should log the accepted logins, successful logins, and failed logins. Because the inclination is, well, that's a lot of data as you get to tens and thousands of users. Even when I was at the university, we had uh, likely tens of thousands of users. I was like, that that's a lot of data to go through. Maybe I'll just, you know, log the failures. And then, you know, very quickly, I learned that, oh, that if an attacker does get in, I'm not going to log that. So I need to, to log. And that was 20 years ago that we were talking about that as a strategy. And obviously, that's a lot very difficult today, even still. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, so, so that was a really interesting one, right? I mean, I, I cut my teeth, if you go back far enough, I, I guess, in the vendor space um, with, you know, with, with Fortinet, who was like a, a network vendor. And what was really fascinating is I remember um, working with teams and they would say, oh, we're just going to go in and, and log all the denies because like that's how we're going to catch the bad guys. And I said, right. well, but if, if you don't log the accepts, then you don't know when they get in. Yep. Um, and what ends up happening, though, and it, that sounds like like the stuff that you were talking about sounds really like normal, right? Like you sit here and you kind of go, but of course you want everything. Of course. But then the practical reality is, is that teams make those decisions every single day. One of the things that Chronicle did that was interesting, almost at the genesis of the company, which goes back to the problem that Google had a while ago, was DNS traffic. Mm. Um, very few companies log DNS traffic. And if they do, it's over very short periods of time. Now, that sounds crazy. You'd look at that and go, oh, but everybody's logging DNS. Not true. I, that surprised me as well. Um, but the long and the short of it is a lot of companies will say, oh, yeah, we kind of want to log DNS, but the problem is, is that we're using these ancient DNS servers, and when we turn on logging, then the performance goes way down and things crash and go bad, and we mm -hmm. can't get more budgeting for DNS, so we just don't log it, and the servers just kind of work. But now you're missing an entire world of security data, um, and, and that ends up being a thing that people just have to kind of deal with. Matt, sorry, or Adrian, do you have a comment earlier? Uh, I was, yeah, I was, gonna say I was that, just going to say, go ahead. Go ahead Adrian's our new host. I'll let him go first. <laughs> <laughs> My, first thing I do is step on toes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, yeah, I was going to say also, you know, I remember nearly 20 years ago, you know, using uh, network intelligence uh, and vision, which was later bought by RSA. Uh, I actually did the analysis on, you know, how long it would take up to, to fill up our Sims disc if we shipped uh, uh, event logs, you know, from Windows hosts, even just from servers to it, you know, and it, it would have killed storage in, in two months or something like that. And on, on some of those uh, Windows servers we had, you know, the, the event log was rolling over every 17 minutes or something insane. 
um, j- just because of the, you know, like file servers and things like that, uh, you know, that, that security log just gets filled really, really quickly. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was something uh, I, I never thought we'd get to a point where we could collect that volume of data, you know, so that this is super interesting from, from that perspective as well. You know, just, uh, you have to rethink your strategies once you, you can actually store all that stuff. Trevor, you, you brought up an interesting point, and I, I like the way you put this, and you were talking when we were prepping for this about um, the data being expressive enough. And I think Adrian hit on a great point. Is you can collect data, let's say from your servers, that represents maybe your Windows event logging, but there are so many different levels of Windows event logging. What granularity are you after? But I, I like how you phrase it as you have to make sure that the data is expressive enough so that you can draw conclusions from it. And I think that's, we may say, I want all the Windows event logs, but what, what's the devil's in the details, right? Yeah, gosh. I mean, so, so that's a really interesting point, right? And I think that, that that gets me kind of into into something kind of fascinating that's happened, right? So it's really funny because we're waxing poetic about, we, you know, we call it 20 years ago problems. And the irony is, is that those problems have like heretofore were not solved. Um, every single day I, I, I speak to companies globally that are making the exact same decisions. Like you, you brought up NI, like Envision. I, I totally used NI Envision. Um, those companies still make those decisions today. Building on that a little bit, the idea of log expression is important, right? When it comes to detection. So what ends up happening is, right? You have this world where because of the inability to bring in all the data, never mind analyze it. We're just saying just centralizing it all. But because of the inability to go and centralize the data from 100,000 endpoints at our company, or because of our inability to afford to bring in all that data, we don't. And instead what we do is we rely on detection to be decentralized. So I'll give you a specific example. We would say something like, you brought up the idea of windows and endpoints. We would go and say, well, I don't have a sane way to bring in the data from all of my endpoints, particularly in COVID times, um, because those endpoints are distributed everywhere. So instead I'll install an EDR on there uh, and that endpoint detection and response platform it will be responsible for doing all of the detection on each individual endpoint. And then I'll roll up the alerts into whatever my centralized thing is. The problem though, is that if, if the centralized thing is only getting alerts and you're missing like 100% of all the data around the alert, then everything is predicated on A, you know, those alerts giving you enough information to actually make decisions, but it gets worse Because now when you want to go and make, when you want to go and have like meta ideas about what's going on, if I want to go and knit together my EDR, my identity, my cloud, my NDR, and, 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 all of a sudden I'm in a world where all I'm getting is the alerts from everything. You know, I really don't have cloud logs, is that I have cloud alerts. I don't have endpoint logs, I have endpoint alerts. Really what I end up having is not log centralization, I have alert centralization. The problem is, is that alert centralization means that I can't do any meta level detection. And and quite frankly, it causes a huge problem because now I'm I'm hoping that all the stuff coming to me is expressive enough to be able to try to do that meta detection in the real world. It never is. Uh, Trevor, we've been talking about this for a a, a little while now, this concept of sensors and brains, right? Mm. And, And what you just described is, well, I have an EDR sensor and brain over here. It's doing its own processing. I might have a network detection response sensor and brain sitting over here. I got a threat detection and response brain sitting over here. So I have all these distributed brains. And and so the challenge is, how do you create like the neural brain network to like really get into the contextual data that you need to bring all that stuff together in, in a, in a more formalized way. And, you know, I'm curious on your thoughts about, you know, how do you, how do you shift that model, right? Do, do we leverage, look, is Sysmon enough at the endpoint? if I'm pulling everything with a Windows event to give me the same level of information an EDR would, but gives me more because now I can correlate that data with other data to actually get a better brain? (laughs) Yeah, gosh. There have been a lot of attempts to do the thing you're talking about, right? So I think back, you know, to my McAfee days and McAfee um, had a concept that they called security connected. And the idea was there would be a bus between all of the McAfee things and the bus would end up enabling them to all communicate in a sane way. That way it's kind of like, if McAfee kind of had sensors kind of in a lot of places, then EPO or other related things could be the brain. 
Um, Microsoft has a similar strategy with Graph, right? I mean, Graph and kind of its related components, it ended up being like, well, all these vendors could plug into Graph and then they'll exchange data in kind of a way that makes sense. And then based upon that, then we can kind of do correlation and detection across all these things. Or we can develop meaning between a lot of different things because they'll be informed about each other. The reality is, is that like, like I haven't seen that happen in real life. Um, you know, relying on the concept of buses, uh, I haven't seen, so I, I just haven't seen that work in real life. Um, instead, I think the challenge is you have to address the challenge that you're really seeing. The challenge you're really seeing is none of this is hard, right? We've already talked about things like Syslog or Syslog for that matter. There's always ways to move data around. The problem is, is that it has always been scale. You sit here and I kind of go, I want to detect from a hundred thousand, I want to bring in a hundred thousand endpoints worth of contemporaneous data, literally like file open, registry key. They did this, they did that, da, 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 da. and it's a huge amount of data. Our biggest problem isn't really network anymore. The biggest problem ended up being, how do I store the data? Um, can I bring it into one place at ultra high speed? And can I store it in one place for an appreciable, useful period of time? Um, that's something that Chronicle and Google Cloud and actually Cloud at large is really, really well positioned to do. Um, this means, for example, that you can now go in and say, you know, um, all of these things that I, I have previous investments in, whether it be in Microsoft endpoints, whether it be in Apple endpoints, whether it be in CrowdStrike, whether it be in, I mean, Tanium, whether it be in whatever, all these things I have investments in, they have the ability to create huge amounts of telemetry. The problem is, is that nobody's listening. Um, and the reason nobody's listening is because of scale. So when we address that problem, all of a sudden, I mean, I'll give an example. In the world of Tanium, Tanium was creating gigantic amounts of telemetry, just storing it on endpoints which was great. It's super cool. But there was no concept of being able to ship that all into one place until Chronicle came around and said, oh, you've got 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, 300,000 endpoints worth of data. You want to stream all in real time? Well, great. We have the bandwidth and capability to bring all of that in seamlessly. And moreover, I can run analytics against it sub-second, any quantity of data. Yeah, and that really flips the model in some respects, where we've we've thought about all these systems kind of being isolated. Now, we've also attempted the data lake. Right? <laughs> I mean, I worked at RSA under the EMC Federation for a while. I remember those days of everybody trying to build the data lake. I think data lake in a cloud provider scale like Google is very different than trying to build your own data lake on-prem, because there's still scale issues with the old traditional kind of data lake structures, isn't there? Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great question. I mean, so you know, the thing about data lakes is that data lakes are kind of a funny thing, right? Because conceptually, a data lake, you know, what what people wanted to do was, well, we'll have all business intelligence, we'll have um, all operational intelligence, we'll bring in all security intelligence and all the other matters of intelligence from from an entire corporation, store them in a singular entity, and then we'll have processors that can then go and access all of that data. Where the devil comes in is in the details. So one of them has to do with, A, um, I need to go and scale that data. If we're a large company, um, scaling that data, you start going like, oh, yep, yep, we're running, pick one, Hadoop. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. We're running Hadoop. And, and then all of a sudden, we, we have this problem of, of just getting it big enough because we're not in the data center business. We're, you know, we're a shipping company. Why? We're not, we're not in the data center business. Um, so that becomes a problem because I'm, it's not my core competency, but it gets way worse though. And let me explain the way worse. The way worse comes in that you need to interpret the data. Me going in and throwing a whole bunch of, of raw telemetry into a data lake does nothing um, because the data must be interpreted in order for the data to be compared, um, which means that you need a, some kind of normalization happening. Well, now what you're saying is now I need some kind of processing that goes on. I've got to bring in all the data. I need to normalize into something that makes sense, that permits comparison between similar devices. Um, which means I need to create the idea of data modeling. And then once I have data modeling, now I need to store those somewhere. Um, and then I need the ability to go and scale that. Um, and this is where you kind of get into that same problem that people just repeatedly try to solve. Can we do away with data models? Or can we do away with indexing? Can we do away with you know, all of this? Like, How do we do away with it while still maintaining the ability to make it super fast, but then also store it cheaply? Um, and I think that Chronicle is the first time that I've seen that paradigm like shift for real, which is probably a really big reason, um, you know, why I joined the company is I, I walked around the RSA. I, I went to RSA like every year because vendors invited me and every company I met at RSA, I mean, like every company either solved a problem that I didn't care about, or it solved a problem I really cared about, but they couldn't scale it in a meaningful way. Um, and this was the first time that 
saw like the intersections of both. And I was like, I, I need to be a part of that because that matters. So Trevor, we're talking about uh, being able to collect the data, transport it, store it. And then I believe where Chronicle comes in and what I want to get to is the analysis, querying, interpreting, and normalizing. So I guess my question is like, does it matter where, how I'm collecting or transporting it? I can send it to Chronicle. Like does Chronicle have an agent or are you uh, based on integrations? And then uh, the second part is what, what, what's the advantage that Chronicle has in that analysis and interpretation? Yeah, both, both very, both very good questions, Paul. So, um, one, I mean, from a, one of the first things you've got to think about when you're going in and centralized and forming analysis is getting in whatever data, the corpus of data to be analyzed is, um, in, in Google's case and Google cloud and Chronicle, um, bringing in data is easy. So whether it be at a hundred events per second or a whatever, you know, a trillion events per second, I, I'm, I'm being ridiculous, but some gigantic number, it doesn't really matter. So back in the ArcSight days of thinking about, oh my gosh, 20,000 events per second is a lot, um, that those figures now are, they're, they're trivial and silly. Like they're, they're, they're tiny. Um, but the other thing that you bring in is like getting in the data in the first place. It's not just kind of like the network bandwidth. It's almost like, um, do you have the ability to go and interact with all the different APIs that are out there? I'm, mm. I'm leveraging CrowdStrike. Can you, can you interact with the CrowdStrike APIs, which by the way, are mostly hosted in AWS meaningfully? The answer is yes, of course, that's easy. Um, can you interact with Proofpoint because it has its own APIs? Of course, that's easy. Um, but additionally, how do you go and get data in from all endpoints? Well, a lot of companies now are going to have endpoint management systems, be they everything from you know McAfee to you know kind of new EDR, XDR type offerings. Um, but moreover, I think that you also go and start thinking about like, well, what about cloud? Um, can I go and bring in workload information? Can I bring in things like uh, guard duty? Can I bring in things like uh, SCC from Google? Um, the answer is yes, of, of course. And where the hard part comes in now ends up being all the interfaces to all these different things, which Chronicle's actually built out hundreds and hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. But not just that, but also the ability to go and, and normalize and make sense of all of them. Chronicle's done a similar thing in that we can interpret hundreds and hundreds of things and be able to store them into a singular common schema that no longer means that endpoint, cloud, and kind of traditional on-prem are, are all different things. Instead, there's something that can now be melded together and considered as a singular corpus of data, which means, I'll give you a very specific example. Let's suppose that you've got credential stuffing happening. You're thinking about operational technology. You're also thinking about information security. Um, but additionally though, you're thinking about, well, I need to look at all my CDNs, great. Um, additionally, I need to look at all my internal applications, great. I need to go and look at all the security parameters that I have and I need to understand the considerations of things like authentication, great. Um, but beyond that, now what I need to do is I need the ability to go in and have an analysis platform that permits, for example, technical things like open windows existing. I need the ability to go and say, now that all these open windows exist, I want the ability to go and consider who's logging in, who appears to be you know, subject to credential stuff, but it gets more interesting. Now that I brought in all that data, then I need to be able to go and say, what happened? So credential stuffing happened. Okay. It was successful. Okay. It happens. Um, then what did they do? And the what did they do part is now where you kind of want things like understanding lateral movement. This is where I want like all that contemporaneous data, but available to me instantly. In the case of Google and Chronicle, data is available to you in fractions of a second, whether it be from last year or whether it be from a second ago, it's instant. Time is an important yeah, so component. I'd like, yeah, go ahead, Adrian. I'd like to dive a little deeper into, you know, talking about... Um, you know, dealing with the data itself, because uh, traditionally, you know, with, with uh, this kind of product, uh, there's a lot of operational overhead uh, with, with the activities that happen there. And if I can, you know, I, in my mind, at least, I, I tend to split it into three categories. You know, you've got the the agent or the the tool that you use to pull the data into, into Chronicle, you know, so that's, uh, you know, it knows how to talk to the API, it knows how to pull that data in. Um, and, and traditionally, you know, the, the, the SIM vendor would have uh, some of those, but then you'd have to build some of those. Uh, and then normalizing the data, traditionally, the SIM vendor would have a couple hundred parsers, um, but maybe you've got your own app, you know, with its own data types or, you know, uh, some products that are, that are more rare, you know, that, that no customers have asked for yet. So those parsers haven't been built. And then you have the issue, you know, I remember once with Envision, uh, we used a product called Iron Mail, 
you know, that would allow you to, you know, securely deliver mail and encrypt, encrypt mail and stuff like that. And um, internally, we upgraded to 6.0 and Envision decided they didn't have enough customers using it. So they were going to leave it at 5.5. And, and the, the logging completely changed. Um, so, so that's my, my, my question there is, is how do you deal with that? How do you, well, and sorry, the third piece would be how you actually query it. You know, do I need an Elasticsearch cheat sheet? Um, you know, how, how, what's the learning curve there and learning how to pull that data out of there? Because sure, it's helpful that it's all in one place, but only if I know how, how to use the query language, how to write a query, uh, you know, and, and how, how to pull all those different types of data out. Sorry, it's, it's, that, that's a lot to, to unpack together there, but um, I hope that made sense. It, it does. Thank you. So, um, you know, hitting on the things that you said, I mean, they definitely come from a place of experience. Um, so uh, a couple of things I'd go and point out. So A, one of the things that Chronicle does that that's, I'm not going to go and say unique, but very rare, um, is Chronicle stores raw data and operates on raw data. This means that you know, the idea of normalization is something that kind of occurs after the fact, which means that the data is brought in, it's stored, uh, it's normalized, and then, of course, you can operate upon it and do everything. But you can also operate upon the raw data as well. This means, for example, that suppose you brought up the iron, ma- you know, the iron mail kind of versioning thing. Um, that comes from a place of, of pain, I'm sure. I've encountered similar pain in my life. Um, you know, one thing that's really neat about Chronicle is the ability to go and say, oh, yeah, the parsing changed or it broke or something happened. Um oh, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go and update the parsing. And the parsing could be updated by you. It could be updated by Chronicle. It could be updated by a Chronicle partner. It could be updated by whomever. Um, and then it just works. In other words, you could run it across the data that was damaged. And then you could say, yep, that's the thing from now forward. So you kind of have this elasticity when it comes to parsing that I think is really amazing. And what it doesn't require, there's, there's products out there that do a similar idea. The problem with similar products is that that idea of kind of redoing the parsing requires the reconstructing of data models, which is an ultra timely process. Whereas Chronicle can go and do this type of thing in like, I don't know, a few seconds, a minute. Um, in a lot of kind of solutions that do this type of thing, you say, oh, okay, I need to rebuild, I need to redo everything and then rebuild the data model. And the data model is also being written to while it's being rebuilt. So that's going to take like days before it works properly. Uh, in our world, it's like a few seconds or a minute. Um, Building on that a little bit, there's also the querying thereof. Um, totally get it. So no, the answer is like you're not having to go and learn like some some new kind of wacky language. Um, instead, you know, there's there's kind of like two major parts of Chronicle. I would say, um, you know, there's leveraging Chronicle where Chronicle is like a very visual thing. The idea is to go in and lay your data out in such a way that you're almost like clicking through it. Um, and and that idea stems from the idea that we wanted to go and create a platform that could do threat hunting on mass and to do so in a way that it, it, it took away like the black art of threat hunting. Um, you no longer do like really wacky queries and know exactly what you're looking for because you're a data science, you know, vis-a-vis level three threat hunter type person. Um, we wanted the ability to go and leverage things like prevalence to be able to tell you that relative to your environment, these things are very weird. Um, and not do things like here's the Alexa top 1 million and thus we're going to go in and say these things are weird because... Alexa says they're weird. Well, maybe, but the thing is, is that, you know, the Alexa top 1 million doesn't really apply to you if in fact you have like a really wonkish industry. Like if I'm in the pharmaceutical industry, the places that we're going out to often probably aren't in the Alexa top 1 million. If I'm in power generation and I'm located in, let's say the Middle East, the reality is a lot of the websites I'm going to um, just aren't in the Alexa top 1 million because why would they be? Um, So then of course you're firing off all kinds of alerts that people learn to ignore. Um, so prevalence in our world enables that ability. Now, building on the thing that you kind of brought up, like, okay, I want to do random queries. What do I do? So one, we do have the ability to perform filtering of data very easily. You could do regular expressions, even on raw data if you want. But where the really cool part comes in is something we're building out has to do with leveraging Google Cloud properties. Um, and these would be things like BigQuery and Looker. Um, Looker is kind of like a way of being able to visually, BigQuery, you can kind of think of as a, a limitlessly scale you know, kind of like SQL type database, um, totally serverless, ultra fast, et cetera. Um, and then the ability to go and leverage Looker on top of that data means that you can go in and say, oh, well, what we want to do is we want to like visually like just rip across this data. We want the ability to go and take that data, create the graph, look for this, go and set up a big query machine learning model. And, and literally you can, you can almost like rip through your data in such a way that doesn't require a gigantic amount of expertise. And it doesn't require you to say, 
be some big expert in query languages. Um, I'm not a big expert in a lot of in, in most query languages, and I find it pretty trivial. Um, so yeah, Matt. Okay, cool. Questions for Adrian? Any questions for Trevor? I'm good. Yeah. Um, one last one. Um, you know, with a cloud model like that, uh, I, I guess two part question: How often do you run into? Uh, I'm not comfortable sending you all my data. And uh, second part, like, like what's the response you have for that? Cause I'm sure it's some variation on, yeah, that that's the only, only way it's going to work. We, we can't do this on prem for you, you know? So, so privacy concerns there, how, how do you alleviate those and deal with those? Yeah. I mean, that, that's super fair. So um, that was probably the, one of the first questions that I had, you know, prior to joining, you know, Chronicle um, before it was even kind of like a Google thing was like, what do we do with regards to privacy? Because a lot of people are really cagey about data being anywhere, quite honestly, outside of their own physical systems. And I mean, literally physical systems. Um, so in the case of that question, which, which again, I, I get periodically, um, what I tend to say is, look, the world of Chronicle is, is kind of your world. Literally, it's us going in and providing a section of Google Core where your data can reside and you alone access it. In fact, it's controlled by your single sign-on. We don't have like even our own authorization. You control it. You control authentication. You control authorization. Um, the data is encrypted at rest. In fact, Google's standards for Google Core to keep it secure are world-class. They're phenomenal. Building on this a little bit more, though, is you know I would say that one of the aims of Google Cloud, and I'm, I'm being pretty transparent here, one of the aims of Google Cloud is to be considered the secure cloud, um, which means that every customer security, whether you're using Chronicle or not, but every customer security is, is like tremendously important. Um, there's really no, like there's, there's, there's no, I guess, like larger goal um, of information, you know, insofar as if in fact Google decided to say, oh, we're going to start looking at customers' data and doing weird stuff with it, uh, it would destroy the company. Um, you know, and right now Google Cloud's the fastest growing, or growing cloud provider in the world, precisely because of being the secure cloud and precisely because of all those security considerations. Um, you know, and I, I think Google does security really, really well. Um, and I think it's been a really good steward, um, you know, of customer security data. Um, the second part of your question, um, could it be done on-prem? And I'm, I'm sorry for missing that. Um, no, I mean, uh, certainly not, right? I mean, then you get into that idea of, uh, you know, again, gigantic data centers, you know, like we, we back up a truck with yeah. like 5,000 systems and everything yeah, else. Yeah, no, I wasn't asking if it could be. I, I, I know the answer to that is no. I was just curious, yeah. like, how, how you handle that with the customer, because I've had to handle that as well. I've worked for vendors where the product was SaaS based, and, and that was that. You know, it just wasn't worth trying to do on-prem it was just it was too much pain that you know so yeah if you want it to totally work at scale it be. it's, it's just <laughs> it's always tricky it's always tricky to handle that question for customers who say oh we have this uh no SaaS policy Every, everything's got to be where i can see it and touch it and feel it yeah i mean i i think an important consideration with that right is one of the, the great parts about Chronicle, right, being in that infrastructure, it means that the ability to go and, and just like spin up like 100,000 processors is trivial. That ability to go and take a petabyte of data and just rip across it in fractions of a second is trivial. And it's because of Google's unique infrastructure that that's possible at all. Um, you know, these are things that, that, are, that are just building that out is, is something that like, you know, Urs Holtze, you know, like way back in like the dawn of Google being a garage company, the ability to go and scale Google was something that was like a, you know, like a gigantic problem, like to make it work. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, that our customers are pretty excited about is being able to leverage that extreme infrastructure where you could type the president of the United States name within the data, regardless of the cardinality, it comes back instantly. And you could type in like your first grade teacher's name, it comes back instantly. Like that concept of like no, no penalties for cardinality is, is an amazing thing when it comes to being able to do detection. Great point. Trevor, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly today. Uh, for folks that want to learn more, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash chronicle. Stay tuned. Coming up next is the Enterprise Security News.